Welcome back to Old School Sports and our Out of the Park Baseball 25 series, Can We Save the Oakland A's? And the saving of the A's has gone pretty well here in the 2036 season. We just made it to the All-Star break. Uh, we are two games behind the mighty Texas Rangers in the AL West, but we are six and a half clear of the final wild card spot in the American League. So with two primary goals to achieve this season, achieving a winning record and improving our team's starting pitching ERA, doing pretty well with both of those, uh, close to a 600 winning percentage on the season, we were certainly looking for more than just a winning record and hoped that we would return this team to the playoffs after they missed the postseason last year following four consecutive trips to October. And as we sit here on July 21st feeling pretty good about our prospects of not just having a winning record, but returning this team to the playoffs. And although it has times been a bit of a circuitous route to improving our starting pitching, uh, ultimately we are eight spots higher than we were a year ago. And with some young talent that has come up and is coming up through our system, as well as some trades that we've made, uh, feeling like hopefully our starting pitching is uh, getting into a better spot than maybe it has been over the last season, season and a half. It's historically been a strength of this team. Uh, I've had some ups and downs over the last couple of seasons, but think that we are trending back in a positive direction with the starting pitching. As we uh, get ready for the episode, I mentioned that uh, the All-Star Game is coming up in just a couple of days. Three All-Stars for the Oakland A's this year. All position players, uh, which is kind of a unique thing for us over the course of this playthrough. Our pitching has generally been stronger than our everyday players, but not the case this year. Uh, first baseman Juan Ramos, second baseman Alejandro Landin, and center fielder Jake Ortega, all named to the All-Star team. And uh, Ortega, who was the AL MVP a couple of years ago, uh, perennial All-Star, perennial contender for the batting title, and a uh, guy who could win another MVP award this year, was the leading vote-getter uh, among everyone in baseball for the All-Star game. So nice to see Ortega getting his recognition as one of the true greats in fictional baseball here in 2036. I think this is going to be a relatively brief episode. We're only going to sim about a week and a half up into the trade deadline. Haven't made any trades yet. Uh, what I will say is that I'm pulling together some scouting reports on some players and there's a chance that we do something, and there's a chance that we do something with uh, a familiar name, possibly more than one familiar name. Uh, we'll see what happens. I'm going to wait till those scouting reports and uh, see if maybe some other players get shaken loose or the prices uh, come down for some of the guys that we're looking at. But it's something I've spent a fair amount of time offline working on over the last day, day and a half in real life. And uh, we've got some interesting targets, and if uh, something begins to materialize, we'll be talking about that in this episode. One other thing that uh, I want to address that uh, did come up, uh, comments from Expedient Falcon and Peter Hooper, that center fielder Mike Goff, who dropped to us in the fourth round because of his impossible-to-sign tendencies, is still looking for over $10 million, and both Expedient Falcon and Peter Hooper kind of said, don't know that he's really a $10 million player, but if you've got the money and there's nothing else to use it on, maybe it's okay to make an offer to him. I think I kind of have the same opinion and the same approach. If we don't end up making an offer to Goff, it's not going to be the end of the world. Right now, we've got almost $16 million available, despite having the uh, second lowest budget and the second lowest payroll in baseball right now. 
but I'm not planning on doing anything with golf until we get past the trade deadline. It's conceivable that when we get to the trade deadline, we're going to have a lot less money available if we make some trades and bring on some significant contracts, in which case uh, there's not going to be much to talk about with golf. But it's also conceivable that we end up getting a player and having a team retain a big chunk of his contract and maybe do another trade where we get rid of somebody making a decent amount of money and we end up with more money available in about a week and a half than we have today despite making some trades. And if things end up materializing that way, then it's a little more likely that I might uh, throw an offer out and try to bring Goff into our system. Although I, in a world where this was real money and in a world where I would need to discuss these types of decisions with my owner. Uh, I agree that Goff is probably not someone worth a $10 million signing bonus, but in OOTP, if I don't end up having anything else to spend the money on, it's uh, not inconceivable. I'll throw some money Mr. Goff's way. And one of the familiar names that I've been scouting uh, just moved forward a day, and we've got the updated scouting report on him, and that's Colt Keith, who had six and a half brilliant years in Oakland after we picked him up in a trade with the Tigers. We dealt him to San Francisco uh, before the trade deadline last year uh, because he's getting older. He's always been fragile physically, and he's making a lot of money this year and set to potentially opt in to make even more next year. So given that we dealt him away because he's getting older and his defense has deteriorated, his offense has deteriorated, he's making lots of money, he's fragile physically, and he's only put up a 74 WRC plus for the Giants this year, you're probably asking the uh, very reasonable question, hey, old school, you dummy, why are you thinking about investigating bringing back Colt Keith? And it's a great question. I don't appreciate being called dummy, but sometimes that needs to be done to get me to snap to attention. But although Keith hasn't performed well this year, We've got this updated scouting report on him, and based on his ratings, it looks like he can still be a pretty effective hitter against right-handed pitching. We don't necessarily see that this year, although his splits against right-handers are better than his splits against left-handers, I guess with the strange exception of his slugging percentage. But third base hasn't been a perfect position for us this year. Keith's ultimately, ultimate replacement, uh, Rodney Mesidor, has actually done reasonably well for us. Putting up a 113 WRC+. Plus. We like his glove. But he is a right-handed hitter who's got a better profile against left-handed pitching. And we basically only moved him from um, being a guy who was playing primarily against lefties into the lineup every day. Because we've been uh, having some problems with Nelson Castellanos, the other third baseman on our roster, who's hitting just 241 this year with a 66 WRC+. Plus. Actually, I said that wrong. Um, Castellanos had started out the season playing against left-handed pitching, and uh, we've since then taken him out of the lineup. So Mesidor is playing both against righties and lefties. And you can certainly ask, why would you take Mesidor and his 113 WRC plus out of the lineup for an aging, fragile, ineffective, not so good defensively, slow Colt Keith. And it's a very legitimate question. Um, I think Keith is certainly better than Castellanos. 
And Castellanos is a guy who does have option years left, so we should be able to get him down to AAA and easily open up a spot on the 26-man roster if we trade for Keith. But most importantly to this whole equation here is the fact that um, San Francisco is just not looking for a lot for Keith. And in addition to the fact that they are not looking for a lot for Keith. I mean, they're looking for a useful player for Keith, don't get me wrong, but they're not looking for anything crazy for Keith. And even more importantly than that, they are willing to retain potentially a really big chunk of Keith's salary, which uh, makes it much more palatable for us to keep him on board, not just this season, but in the event he uh, opts into a contract for next year. But it also uh, gives us some cover if we decided we needed or wanted to trade him. Um, he's going to be a lot easier to trade if there's a few million dollars on our books next year rather than $26 million. And he's also very popular, and uh, we might get a little bump in fan interest reuniting with Mr. Keith. And fortunately for us, uh, one of the guys that the Giants are willing to take is Juan Ibarra. Signed him as a minor league free agent uh, Christmas Eve of last year. Captain personality, and he is an outstanding defensive catcher with almost five years of major league service time. But he's not much of a hitter, and he's stuck in double A for us. Um, he's unhappy with uh, his role on the team. We've got um, plenty of good catchers in double A AA and triple A. Um, probably none who are as good defensively as him, but many who we think have a better mix of defense and hitting. So the fact that we can potentially reunite with Mr. Keith for Juan Ibarra makes sense for me. And the fact that the Giants are willing to keep 90% of Colt Keith's contract uh, makes it an absolute layup as far as I'm concerned. Um, again, I don't know if maybe Keith is just shot. His ratings don't tell me that, but his, well, his batting ratings don't tell me that. More specifically, I guess his batting ratings against right-handed pitching don't tell me that he's shot. If I look at his performance on the field, if I look at his speed, if I look at his deteriorating defense, and if I even look at what he does against left-handed pitching, then... I definitely have more questions about whether or not he's actually shot, but for a million dollars this year and then potentially $2.6 million next year if he opts into the contract, and given that, as we talked about, I think he's a clear upgrade from Castellanos, um, at least in terms of how Castellanos has hit this year, we're going to reunite with the veteran Colt Keith and Mesidor, despite his good performance, is going to be playing primarily against left-handed pitching for us and will also serve as a defensive substitution in the late innings for Colt Keith, hopefully if we have leads in a lot of games and we can tighten up our defense. Mesidor at 26 years old kind of is what he is. You know, we think maybe his contact and his eye can get a little better. But at his age, um, not honestly all that concerned about uh, him playing every day to give him the best chance possible to develop those last little bits of potential that he may or may not really have. But we're going to try to catch lightning in a bottle with a guy who's pretty important to us in this playthrough. When we brought Colt Keith on board in 2029, or actually I believe it was late 2028, ahead of the 2029 season. Uh, all we did in our first season with Colt Keith on board was win the one World Series title that we've won with these Oakland A's. And maybe history will repeat itself. So thanks for playing in 30 games in double A for us, Mr. Ibarra. I think with your great defense, San Francisco probably will use you in a much more suitable role.
But we're going to bring Mr. Colt Keith back on board. The fans happy that Keith is back in the saddle. Fan interest was 64 before. And we got a nice three-point boost to 67. So I'll certainly be tracking this if we move on from Keith in the offseason. But good to see uh, fan interest at least temporarily moving in the right direction. Um, now we're just going to have to figure out how to open up a spot on the 40-man roster for Mr. Keith. And we've gotten a couple more scouting reports back. I uh, haven't made a move yet since we're not actually playing our first game out of the All-Star game until tomorrow. Uh, so my thought was rather than force a trade or force ourselves to wave in DFA somebody to get Mr. Keith onto the 40-man roster again, uh, we had a little bit of time to see if maybe we could put another trade together. And depending on who was in the trade, uh, we might open up a spot on the 40-man roster organically. So a couple scouting reports back. Dylan Cruz has been one of the top players on the trade block. He's in the final year of a big contract with the Nationals. The issue is that he's still not willing to waive the no-trade clause. Um, in terms of his defensive ability, in terms of his current production with a 148 WRC plus and 4.2 war this season, Adding a bat like Cruz into the mix would be a big asset for us, uh, but it just doesn't seem like he's going to be willing to waive that no trade clause. Things could change over the next week, but uh, doubt that they will. Taking a look at the standings, the Nationals are tied for first in the National League East, and he is a well-established player there, so I can kind of understand that he's not necessarily that enthusiastic about moving on but another guy that we got a scouting report on is Chase DeLauder and you may remember him because we mentioned the 2029 World Series that we won when Colt Keith joined us and Chase DeLauder uh, was both the ALCS and the World Series MVP for us that year uh, had a magical run in the playoffs for us Another guy who's aging, he'll be 35 right when the season is getting over, at least the regular season. Not making a lot of money this year, so it would be very easy to fit into the team. He's still competent defensively, and he's a left-handed hitter who looks like his bat should still be good against right-handed pitching. Now, being fair, although he had that incredible playoff run with us in Oakland over parts of four seasons with us in the A's. He was a completely league average offensive player with a 100 WRC plus, which is a little better than what he's been over the course of his career. When we look at his batting splits this year in terms of his WRC plus, he's basically been the same against lefties and righties. Looking in the statistics a little deeper, you can certainly argue that maybe he's been a bit better against lefties. So I'm sure some of you are wondering, why are you talking about a 35-year-old outfielder who's at best an average offensive player and is fragile physically? What does he possibly bring to your team that could help you? And... Another great question. To me, what he potentially lets us do is potentially consider moving on from the left-handed hitting Bobby Cabral, who's put up a 77 WRC plus for us this year. But after a solid start to his Oakland career, over the last three years, was a league average offensive player a year ago and well below average two years ago and this season. He's got that Hedero Endo, Byron Brain type profile with mediocre to poor contact and an insane number of strikeouts. Love having the captain personality around. 
but his contract is one that's starting to get a little bit high. Probably one that we want to try to get off our books as he heads into his 30s. And if we go back to why are you looking at an aging Chase DeLauder, well, an average bat from a left-handed hitting outfielder who's not making a ton of money might be a better thing for us to have in the lineup than the below average bat we seem to have now with Cabral, who strikes out a ton and is making a lot more money and is also guaranteed a lot of money over the next few seasons. So although this one is not necessarily going to be earth shattering, um, it's still something that I'm thinking about. Now the issue, because things can never be simple, is that everyone in baseball pretty much recognizes that uh, Bobby Cabral at this point with his performance on the field and the money he's set to make is essentially completely useless. We could get Brady Abel for him, 28-year-old in the Rockies organization, third baseman who's signed to even more guaranteed money, significantly more, two and a half times more per season than Cabral is, who's also been a well below average offensive player over the last season and a half. He's a left-handed hitter who's competent at third base. But even against right-handed pitching, that profile isn't in the same neighborhood as Colt Keith's. So although if we hadn't traded for Keith, you could argue maybe a trade for a Bell, I don't want to be taken on that kind of contract. But the broader point is we're just not going to be able to trade Bobby Cabral for Chase DeLauder. DeLauder's price is not crazy. You can see there are a ton of guys that make a trade for Chase DeLauder work. So again, it's not something that's impossible for us to do. The big issue is how many good players do we have to add to this deal if we also throw Bobby Cabral into the deal and how much of Cabral's contract are we going to be forced to retain to potentially try to get him off the books. So that is something that I'm still thinking about. We do have one more guy we're waiting for an updated scouting report on and that's Yanquil Fernandez left-handed hitting out of the Mariners organization, another corner outfielder, left-handed bat, better against righties than he is against lefties, certainly has more power than DeLauder, but not quite as good in terms of making contact with the ball. He's also a guy who's making a lot more money than DeLauder. And when we look at Yankeel Fernandez, um, there is still a pretty large pool of players that we could trade for him, similar to DeLauder in that regard. So I think I want to wait to at least get the scouting accuracy on Fernandez up above average before pulling the trigger on DeLauder. Because Fernandez is having a monster year, a 147 WRC plus, and he's got a 116 WRC plus for his career. So although he makes a lot more money, and he's not as good defensively, and he's not quite the same type of contact hitter, or quite the same type of guy in terms of drawing walks, he's been a more productive hitter over the course of his career, granted. A decade plus of that was in Colorado, so some of those offensive numbers are probably a bit inflated. But I'd like to know a little bit more about Fernandez, so we're hoping that the 
updated scouting report on him. And granted, the last one we have is only a couple weeks old, but for whatever reason, it's only average scouting accuracy. Would love to uh, have a fresh scouting report with very high accuracy on Mr. Fernandez before we decide whether he or DeLauder or perhaps somebody else or perhaps nobody else is the right answer for us to pursue in conjunction with a potential exit from Berner Cabral. And for those of you who were wondering about the potential uh, departure of Cabral, if we do make something happen, given that he does have that captain personality, uh, we do still have another captain in Jason DeCaro and a lot of other leaders in the clubhouse. Team chemistry is ecstatic right now. Uh, certainly don't love moving on from someone that's a real positive influence in the clubhouse, potentially. Um, he's without question the team leader. Uh, unfortunately, he's without question not a very productive offensive baseball player over the last two and a half years. And when you are a uh, corner outfielder who's slightly above average defensively, you better be a darn good offensive player. And we just haven't gotten that from Burner over the last few seasons. And since we're still waiting on the scouting report, we are going to have to make a move to open up a spot on the 40-man roster. Uh, we're going to trade away the young reliever, Jeff Harbaugh. He actually did a pretty decent job for us in nine games this year. guy we picked in the 12th round back in 2030. But he's almost 25 years old. Um, tend to think his control is always going to be an issue, and he's a Pretty generic right-handed reliever. Um, like the ground ball tendencies, like that he's got a really good fastball, but certainly a replaceable player. And we can get from Baltimore, uh, reunited with our old friend Estuary Ruiz, who's making $1.4 million. Captain personality, um, still fleet of foot. But he is wrecked physically. Um, the important part of the trade for us is just that the Orioles are willing to hold on to all of his contract. So rather than putting him on to the 40-man after we pick him up, since he does have a major league contract, we'll just release him. So it's basically a um, situation where we're going to get a little bit of money off the books. You can see here that Baltimore, um, with tons of budget space available, is supposedly willing to throw in $18 million um, to make this deal work. To me, that is just stupid. Um, might even be that they would do more than that. I haven't uh, tested it any further. Now 19 pushes it over the limit, but all right. So it looks like 18 was about the limit on what they would do in terms of throwing in cash. Um, but to me, um, even though the game is gonna let me take a massive amount of money, it just does not seem logical. I think that the young reliever Harbaugh is certainly a useful young pitcher who's done really well the last year and a half, moving up through double-A, triple-A, and into the majors. His 2.45 ERA in the majors is the worst that he's had at any stop these last uh, couple of seasons. So he's cheap and a decent player. So I can understand them throwing in some money, but I'm going to cut it back to a third of what they said. Um... Six million dollars will certainly help us and maybe does make it more possible for us to bring on Mr. Goff. But I feel like even though we're on the hard trade setting, which makes some of these trades miserable, um, that just seems like way, 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 way too much cash to be getting for this kind of trade. So cut it back to a third of what it was. Um, I'd like to get some cash. I'd like $18 million in cash, but um, call this just a house rule that I'm making up on the fly here. 
So we're going to trade Harbaugh for Mr. Ruiz. Um, the clubhouse uh, apparently appreciates Mr. Ruiz's uh, leadership. Unfortunately, uh, we're going to immediately wave and DFA him. I guess I should see whether now that he's not making any money, whether he's got any trade value before I just let him go. I wouldn't expect it to be that much, and I'm completely wrong. Although it looks like it's a lot of uh, guys making guaranteed major league money who aren't necessarily huge impact players. And unfortunately, there's nobody who is on a... Uh, or there's a couple guys on minor league contracts, but, you know, guys in their 30s. I'll spend a little time looking at this offline. I don't necessarily think that uh, there's going to be anything all that interesting for me to do. Because the whole point of bringing him on board was to clear up a roster spot. We could get Juan Soto, but... 37, soon to be 38 year old Juan Soto is not what he once was. Especially in that magical half season that we had him in Oakland when he put up a 158 WRC plus for us as a rental. But Soto brings nothing to the table defensively anymore. Still on paper reasonably effective against right-handed pitching but um bringing soto on board would really just be a pure popularity play and we would also have to figure out how to um fit that 30 and a half million dollar contract on our books although with the money that other teams are throwing around i can't imagine they would retain it all they would. Is there any possible way that I can get Juan Soto onto this roster? We don't need him. We talked about Ramos being an all-star at first base, although he's really more of a DH. And Andy Braylovsky is a really good first baseman for us as well. So we don't really have a spot in the lineup for Juan Soto. And as fun as it would be to bring him on board, especially for no money, it would give us a probably huge boost in fan interest, but then I'll be giving myself an aneurysm three months from now when we get two times the fan interest boost that we got for bringing him on board taken away when he signs with somebody else. But I'll spend some time thinking about this offline. I still think I'm inclined to just cut Mr. Ruiz. And I actually did find a deal that I think I like. We're going to trade for the veteran infielder, Brooks Lee. Still competent defensively, has some positive personality traits. He's out three to four weeks with a fractured thumb. He's a below average offensive player now. He didn't used to be. Still has a 110 WRC plus for his career. But he is some useful organizational depth. But most importantly, for purposes of this trade, as we talked about, he's going to be out three to four weeks. So we are actually going to make the trade for him and put him onto the 60-day IL so we don't have to use a 40-man spot on him. But he would potentially still be healthy and available for us late September and in the playoffs if we make the playoffs if we do have any injuries so i think he's a useful player it's another thing where this team has tons of cash available so they were willing to throw in seven million dollars um, to me that again seems too high so i'm going to cut it down by a third i'll take a little more cash of course but i don't want to be 
abusive of these teams that just because they have tons of budget space available as they're getting close to the trade deadline will just dump it on me. I mean, I don't even know exactly what I'm going to spend it all on at this point because it's going to be gone after this year anyways. Just makes potentially bringing the fourth round pick Mr. Goff on board a little more palatable. So we are going to complete that trade for Brooks Lee. And now we should have an opportunity to get Mr. Colt Keith back onto the 26-man roster and the 40-man roster. So we have Colt Keith back on the 40-man roster, back on the 26-man roster, and he's going to be hitting sixth for us, playing third base against right-handed pitching. Uh, Mesidor is now only going to be playing against left-handed pitching for us. Uh, definitely a tough break for Mesidor. Still think he's more of our long-term answer potentially at third base. He'll still be a valuable defensive replacement for Keith, but... Looking at Keith's ratings against right-handed pitching based on that updated scouting report that we just got and the fact that uh, our friends with the Giants are willing to keep most of this contract. It's a roll of the dice I'm willing to take. If it doesn't work out, we can always just put Mesidor right back into the lineup. And we've lost the first two games out of the All-Star break to the White Sox, unfortunately, which has uh, dropped us to three behind the Rangers in the division. We do have the scouting report on Yanquil Fernandez. He's making a lot more money than Chase DeLauder, but he's been a much more effective hitter over the course of his career than DeLauder. He's a little younger. He's not quite as good defensively, but he's better in terms of his injury proneness. And I think he's going to make more contact than Mr. Cabral does. I know he's going to strike out a lot less than Mr. Cabral does. And when we look at what Fernandez has done this season away from Colorado against right-handed pitching. He's put up a 165 WRC+. plus. He's having a monster year against right-handed pitching. So I think the question is just how much, uh, how many prospects are we going to have to include along with Mr. Cabral to get him off of our roster? And will we have to retain a sizable chunk of Mr. Cabral's contract to rent Yanquil Fernandez for the rest of this year. Still a pretty large list of players that we can include to get this deal done. It's just a matter of uh, how negatively does trying to include Cabral in the p contract impact us. And I think we have a deal to bring Yanquil Fernandez on board for the rest of this year. He's an extremely popular guy, so that'll give us another boost. I'm going to remember we got three for Keith. We'll see what we get for Fernandez. Um, but think that he can hopefully help our offense this year, which is already good. And they were willing to throw in a tiny bit of money, but they were also willing to throw in three prospects Pecty types. Bob Reed is a 21-year-old, um, former eighth-round pick. Probably not going to turn into a major leaguer, but he's only 21 years old. Rogelio Campos, 23 years old. Uh, having a solid year in double-A this year. I don't necessarily think he's a big-time prospect. But they're also willing to include the 19-year-old Jorge Castillo, some good personality traits and an interesting potential glove. I don't know that he's ever going to really hit enough to be a major leaguer. He's hitting 059 in his introduction to A-ball this year in 51 at-bats. Now granted, 
He's only 19 years old, so being an A ball is pretty impressive, and he was really good in rookie ball. But he's not a prospect without a chance. We have to give up Santiago Santabanez for a guy with over five years of major league experience who was in our organization. Have to give up Bobby Cabral, but we are getting rid of that contract. And we are replacing him with a, another left-handed hitting outfielder who I think is going to be much better offensively for us this year. Albeit between bringing on Fernandez to play a corner outfield spot and bringing on Colt Keith to play at third base, we've definitely weakened what had been a pretty strong defensive team. And we also have to include Shiloh Solis. You may remember him. This is the, kind of the key to the deal. Guy who used to be a top 100 prospect. We picked him 10th overall five years ago. 23-year-old hasn't quite developed the way that we hoped. We still think he could be a pretty interesting contact hitter with a decent eye. Got a lot of positive personality traits, and he's versatile defensively. Decent speed. But he's hitting a buck 72 this year in double A, and he's already 23 years old. Um, he's had a below 100 WRC plus ever since we moved him from A ball to high A ball. So, really, at this point, over the last two plus seasons in high A and double A ball. And I think it's time to extract whatever value we can get. I don't necessarily think that Castillo's got the same ceiling as Solis, but I don't know that Solis is ever going to reach his ceiling. I think this makes us better this year with the swap from Cabral to Fernandez. And honestly, getting Cabral and Solis, who are both on the 40-man roster off of it, in exchange for just one guy who's going to go on the 40-man, it does uh, leave us with an extra spot on our 40-man roster, which we could conceivably down the line need to use on uh, Brooks Lee when he comes back. Obviously, in retrospect, with the extra spot we've got now, kind of wish we had only put Brooks Lee on the regular injured list, but I don't think there was a guarantee that we were going to make this exact trade and open up two 40-man spots. And I wanted to get Colt Keith onto the roster. So we are going to uh, make this deal with our divisional rival and say goodbye to both Shiloh Solis, once one of the most prized prospects in our organization, and Berner Cabral, who we once thought was going to be a real important corner outfielder for us for many years. So the trade is complete. I think we've got enough leadership without Cabral. Fans are excited that Yanquil Fernandez is on board and we got a four point boost there up to 71. So four points from Fernandez and three points from Colt Keith in terms of the boosts with the rentals for those of you who are keeping score at home. So we will certainly continue to track what uh, Mr. Cabral does over the course of his career. Wish him the best of luck with the Mariners organization. Uh, but with the additions of Colt Keith and Yanquil Fernandez, added a couple more pretty good left-handed hitters along with Braylovsky and Ramos into our lineup against right-handed pitching. Fernandez right now is going to be hitting eighth. Um, certainly could see us moving him up, but give the longtime player on our team, Colt Keith, a little bit of uh, respect by having him in the six hole and hope that Fernandez can provide some protection in the lineup for Arturo Uresti, the youngster. Uh, batting average dipped to 271, and he's just barely above league average at this point. So he would be an easy one for us to drop down further in the order if we need to. But um, hopefully the additional offense from Keith and Fernandez 
helps offset um, the loss of Mr. Harris in the lineup and replacing him with Uresti. And I know that uh, pitching is probably a bigger need for us than everyday players. Just haven't seen anything interesting on the pitching market that's reasonably priced and going to be an impact for us. Uh, continue to look and will continue to look as we approach the trade deadline. Just wanted you to know it's not something I'm ignoring, not something I've forgotten about, but um, to me the trades for Keith and Fernandez were lower priced and potentially more impactful than anything we can do with pitchers right now. And as we close in on the trade deadline, uh, the most interesting relievers available are Jackson Job, uh, who hasn't pitched this year as he's recovering from a torn UCL, as well as our former pitcher, Andrew Nardi, who has done well this year, although he's going to be out for three weeks uh, more at this point. The prices for both of them are relatively high. Position player-wise, as we uh, look at the trading block, Still some more interesting guys out there, but Alvarez and Cruz continue to be unwilling to um, waive their no-trade clauses. Kyle Teal was mentioned by Paul West. Issue with Kyle Teal is he's making $44.5 million, although the Red Sox have retained 80% of that, so he's attainable. Certainly would give us a um, pretty interesting left-handed hitter, although uh, after a really nice career primarily with the Red Sox organization, he's hitting just 256 this year and is a slightly below average offensive player for KC. But he is a seven-time All-Star, a career 300 hitter, a captain who is uh, competent defensively, and he's still a pretty interesting bat against right-handed pitching. Catching really isn't our problem, but if we could get him for a cheap enough price, it looks like we're just trying to assemble an all-star team at this point, at least rent an all-star team for a couple of months. And as we sit here three days ahead of the trade deadline, three behind in the division, six and a half up on the final wild card spot, Ortega continues to lead the league in hitting and batter war third in OPS. Juan Ramos continues to lead the league in ribbies and averaging exactly a ribby a game this year, as has been noted by viewers. Jackson Ferris, who is not honored as an all-star, still tied for second in the league in wins, up to second in strikeouts. As we take a look at our team statistics, First in runs scored, third in runs allowed. 59 and 41 record is two worse than Pythagorean expectations. If we have a weakness, it is pitching as we're third in runs allowed rather than first, but I don't feel like we need to be desperate. And the prices for guys who I just don't think are going to have that huge of an impact for us are a little higher than I'm willing to pay right now. So we'll check in again in a couple of days, but unless people really shake loose in terms of their demands or some team that feels that it's dropped out of it over the last couple of days, uh, add some guys to the trade block, I think we may be about done with what we're going to do this year. And we have received an interesting offer. Um, it's for Luis Taveras, the outfielder who's put up a 133 WRC plus for us this year in 207 at-bats, playing primarily against left-handed pitching. As we've talked about, he's set to make $6 million in arbitration next year. And if he really is just going to be a platoon guy for us against lefties, it's probably going to be time to move on from him next year. Given that he's doing so well and we're a win-now team, I wouldn't generally even entertain such an offer, but 
Cleveland, a last place team, is offering us the veteran second baseman Daniel Maldonado, a three-time All-Star. Putting up a 128 WRC plus this year. We've got an outstanding infield with Ramos at first. Landine at second. Colt Keith and Mesidor now at third. And Andy Toribio at shortstop. But a switch hitting middle infielder. With a career 128 WRC plus uh, is not something that I think any team can really turn their nose up at. The issue is that Maldonado's av offer are going to be making $29 million a year for the next three and a half years. And I'm not expecting that the Guardians are going to be willing to retain a big chunk of his contract. Um, but with what we've seen from teams, you never know. I'm sure they're not going to retain 100% of it. Of course, that's not happening. Yeah, even 50, not going to work for them. Yeah, they'd keep 30% of his contract, which is very generous for a player with his skill set but that still would leave us on the hook for 20 million a year for the next couple of seasons i think he's certainly a guy who is tradable it's incredibly tempting to bring a guy like him on board even though we don't really need him I mean, our offense is just great already, and this could make it greater. -er. But Tavares has been so good and so productive. We're just kind of so weak in the outfield if we move on from Tavares. We traded away Brady Harris a few weeks ago. We just traded away Bobby Cabral. And now we'd be trading away Luis Tavares. It would essentially live us with three outfielders on the major league roster. We probably need to send... Steve Allison down to triple A. Braylovsky can play a not completely embarrassing left field or right field. Maldonado can also play a not completely embarrassing left field, but he'd have to learn the position at the major league level. I just don't know whether we really need another bat. As tempting as the trade is, we've got the best offense in the American League right now. We've added Keith and Fernandez in recent days, which we think makes it better. And I'm just not sure who we take out of the lineup if we brought Campos on board. I mean, Andy Toribio is only hitting 230 this year, but he's much better defensively, and he's still been a league average offensive shortstop with 17 home runs this year who's got a much better glove, we'd be weakening our defense further to take Toribio out. Colt Keith we just traded for. Um, the hope is to find lightning in a bottle with him. He's got two ribbies in three games. 
if we sent Arturo Uresti down, whose batting average has dipped to 247 if they're that very hot start, that just makes things even more difficult as far as our outfield, because uh, then we're basically just down to Ortega and young Keel Fernandez are the only outfielders on our roster. Um, so I feel like this is almost like a fantasy baseball kind of move. It's putting more talent on our team, I think. And I do think at $20 million a year for the next three years, we could potentially trade that contract in the offseason. But I haven't completely ruled bringing Tavares back next year out. And things are working fine with him and the offense in general. So I think I'm inclined to pass. I'm sure if uh, anyone disagrees with me, I trust that you will let me know and tell me why. And after losing those first two games to the White Sox, uh, we've now won three in a row, took the final game of the series against the White Sox, and then two in a row against the Angels, including a 19-6 to win yesterday. So two games left before the All-Star break. Just suffered an injury, but honestly, it's an injury that um, I don't mind. You may remember that um, Jamie DeVore, former starter for us, um, has been refusing minor league assignments. Making $6.5 million this year. Set to make $10 million next year if we were to exercise that team option. And with the money that Mr. DeVore is making, his contract is uh, not all that valuable. We can bring back a huge contract for a player who's got multiple years left. But fortunately, or I mean a decent contract for a guy that's not good enough to be on our 26-man roster. But with that mild shoulder strain and that moderate impact on his throwing, that does give us the opportunity to put Jamie DeVore onto the injured list. And then we'll be able to put him on a nice uh, rehab assignment for most of the month of August. So we'll likely will see him again in September. But that helps clear the log jam that we've had um, recently with Chisin Harimoto unable to get back onto the major league roster. Oh, sorry, he still has six days of IL time left. But um, we'll call up somebody from AAA as a temporary replacement. Um, but we were going to have a difficult time getting Harimoto back onto the roster because there's not really anyone we wanted to send to AAA other than DeVore. So that injury will end up helping us out a bit. And in what may be his final year in our organization, former first-round pick Amari Raphael will take over a long relief spot and we will also uh, use him in mop-up duty. Um... He's put up a 414 ERA in AAA as a starter for us this year. Hasn't been great in the 12 and a third innings pitched. He's pitched at the major league level. I think the control is ultimately going to be the downfall of Mr. Raphael, but got an opportunity to give him a little action over the next week, week and a half, till Harimoto is back. Hopefully only about a week, but... I don't think Raphael is going to show us anything that makes him a part of our long-term plans, but we'll at least get a little more data on which to base whatever decision we end up making. And we ended up sweeping that four-game series at home against the A's, so we begin the month of August on a five-game winning streak. 
and we do begin the month of August. Uh, there was nothing else that we decided to do. Uh, as you might expect, player development update, uh, the aging Colt Keith, his power, his defense, and his uh, current and potential gap power ratings all declined even since we got that scouting report for him just uh, about a week ago in date in game time. So we may end up regretting that, but as I talked about, we still have Mesidor. We still have guys in the minors. And importantly, Yanquil Fernandez, uh, the addition, the other big addition, as well as the youngsters Arturo Uresti and Jesus Saldana, both had uh, excellent months in terms of development. So as we sit here on August 1st, past the trade deadline, two games out in the division, nine and a half games up on the Twins for the final wild card spot. Ortega still leading the league in hitting and batter war. Ramos still leading the league in ribbies. Ferris still second in the league in wins and still second in the league in strikeouts. Taking a look at the team statistics, which aren't going to have changed much. First in runs scored, fourth in runs allowed. Defensive efficiency still strong. Base running still pretty mediocre. But our 63 and 41 record is a game below expectations. And after that weirdly disappointing losing record in June, uh, we bounced back strongly in the month of July playing 700 baseball. So. Feeling pretty confident that we're going to guide this team back into the playoffs. The big question is whether we'll be able to make up those two games on the Rangers over the final two months of the season to uh, end their stranglehold on the AL West. Rangers are right now pursuing a fourth consecutive AL West title, but more importantly than that, they're pursuing a third championship in the last four seasons and would love to uh, get past them and have us be the team celebrating a world championship in late October or early November. And we'll find out uh, what type of progress we make towards ensuring that we're back in the playoffs in our next episode. Until then, thanks so much for watching, and hope you have a great day.